This is the place you live with Ethan and Lou, featuring Mike Allen. Chewy, we're home. On the home of rock and roll, I-95. And here he is. Hey, good morning, gents. Hey. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. You've been I'm, very secretive about this week. Well, I'm, yeah, know. you know, I'm excited. There's a lot of material to go through today. Okay. And, you know, we did that little tease yesterday where sure. we said there's going to be two key points of the development of Danbury that we're going to talk about. And I started thinking about it later. I said, you know, somebody's going to say Candlewood Lake. And that would not be a bad answer. Right. But it's only 100 years old, Candlewood Lake. The lake, right. The lake is only 100 years right. old. I'm talking about things 10,000, 12,000 years old. And when you go back and you look at how this region developed, the two key things are U.S. Route 6 and U.S. Route 7. And those used to be dirt paths way, 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 way back when. I'm talking about Native American time. And where they intersect, right about where the Danbury Mall is now, exit 3, exit 4 of I-84, that's where they intersect, that is the sweet spot in the Danbury region. And that's why it grew to be the way it is today. So we're just going to take a quick look at that because this is kind of like foundational for people to understand how this area developed. Mm -hmm. So back when it was Native Americans, and and we were talking about this a little bit before we came on air, if you drive from Brewster to Danbury, you normally take I-84, right? Fastest way. But if it's backed up, you take Route 6, which is parallel, right? Next time you're on Route 6, just remember that used to be a dirt path. And there used to be Native Americans who were making baskets, brooms, you know, doing some farming and living in Haynes Pond and Sanford's Pond, Lake Kenosha, which, by the way, used to be called Mill Plain Pond before it was Lake Kenosha. Mm -hmm. And where the mall is now, you know, most people don't know the mall was built on wetlands and it's built over the largest aquifer in the region. Um, You know, this was kind (laughs) of it was discussed at the time, but people have forgotten. And that's why the parking lot floods all the time. Right. Right, is because of that. That's why. Yeah. yeah, it's all it's all because of that. And and Native American Indians used to hang out there, and so this is Route Six development was along there in the old 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 days. And then Route Seven, you go I mean, north. Can I stop you for a second? Yeah. What was the year? Do you the round? Oh, this is like 1600s? we're talking. Oh yeah, fourteen hundreds, thirteen hundreds. You know, way way back when the Native Americans had no idea that that parking ride on exit one would turn into a hookup section for old men to have sexual relations in the woods settle down over there all right sir (laughs) so you go uh down uh uh, route seven then into brookfield right where federal road and white turkey road extension connect native americans were there too uh it was huge and then you go up route seven of course to lover's leap into milford and places up around there, the Scaticoke Indian tribe was there, uh, Chief Warmug, I mean, names you recognize, Pocono, Pocono Road, that was uh, a major tribe around the area. So when you start to put all this together, that was the earliest days. But then you move forward, and they suddenly needed to develop the area, right? As the English settlers came in, the, you know, so Route 6, think about this for a second. When you come up from, from New York State, it's Mill Plain Road, Lake Avenue Extension, you get on at exit 4, exit 4 of I-84, from exit 4 to exit 8, 84 and 6 are the same. And then you get off at exit 8 and you go through Stony Hill and Bethel yep. and Newtown. That's Route 6, and it keeps going and it goes into Southbury and Woodbury and, and on. Route 6 is the east-west road. N- Route 7 is north-south. Route 6 is the second longest road in the United States. Come on. It's the second longest road. It starts in Provincetown, Massachusetts, which is when you go up... Candle or up uh, Cape Cod, right? And you go out into the Atlantic Ocean. You see the little arm that goes around there. The very tip of that is Provincetown, and that's where Route Six starts, and it goes all the way out to California. It's three thousand miles. So that's that's Route, route Six. Route Six goes three thousand uh, miles, and it comes right through our town. We should drive so, him, Ethan on a road trip. Well, now here's the other thing. So Route Seven is three hundred miles, and it goes from Norwalk, Long Island Sound. Yeah. Through Connecticut, through the Northwest Hills of Connecticut, one of my favorite drives, uh, through Western Massachusetts, and through Western Vermont, all the way to the Canadian border. So if you drove that 10 times back and forth, I mean, of course, you'd be crazy at the end, but uh, that'd be the same as driving across the country. Holy cow. Whoa. That's super cool. (laughs) So anyway, so so going back to this, so in 1600s, the first map of this area by, you know, the, uh, the white settlers from Europe was a Dutch map, and it shows Route 7 as a path 
from Norwalk to Danbury. So they had oxen carts that had to come in to pull goods, stage coaches in this area, which we'll talk about at a different show because there's some really cool stuff on stage coaches around here. Um, they had that. Then they, of course, uh, brought in the trains, and we've talked about that so many times. The Maybrook line right. from Brewster to Danbury, that's the Route 6 line. And when Ethan, you and I went touring around Newtown that time, we yep. saw those bridge abutments in the Hoostonite River. That was the line that went east yep, up to uh, right. Hartford. And then, of course, the north-south line on Route 7 is the Metro North Danbury South Norwalk line. So you had train development in the 1800s. And then in the 1900s, you had cars. And so suddenly you had to pave these things and turn them into, uh, into interstate highways. So the, the final thing in this segment, and then we'll go into the second segment later. i got some great stuff to tell you about, <laughs> so about Route 7. But uh, the, the final thing is, of course, you had the Danbury Fair right at that sweet spot. And it opened in 1866, the year after the Civil War ended. When it closed in 1981, it was the longest continuously running state fair in the U.S. And it gave way to the largest enclosed shopping mall in New England, which is right there on that spot now, right. the Danbury Fair Mall. In the 1700s, General George Washington realized how important this was. He knew there would be a Forever 21 there one day. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> got his dibs in early. He's, got, he's on the yeah. deed, yeah. So um, he uh, actually, during the Revolutionary War, so if you go back, you know, the shot heard around the world, Lexington and Concord up in Massachusetts, where it all started, was 1775 in April. Right after that, as it got serious, you know, we were fighting the British, Washington looks at the area and he says, wait a second, this is a strategic area, Danbury. And he makes it the supply center for the Continental Army. Mm -hmm. So all the stuff was stored there. And it was such a big deal that the British, who were based in New York City, then said, yeah, we got to take this out. They sailed up Long Island Sound from New York, parked in Campo Beach in Westport, got off their ships marched up Route 58 through Reading, came up through Bethel over Hoyts Hill, and came into Danbury and burned it. How long does it take <clears> to <throat> march that far? Uh, it's uh, <laughs> a couple of days, actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But they camped out overnight and burned some churches along the way that oh, weren't okay. uh, Church sure, of England. Yeah, yeah you know, so they, <laughs> uh -huh. they, 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 they had their fun. Um, and then they came into Danbury, and they burned, like, 20 houses, a bunch of barns. Burned. They said that the... The lard from the barrels of pork that they burned was running ankle deep in the wow. streets. I mean, that's, that's how bad this was. Ooh. So they chased them out of Danbury. General David Worcester chased them out of Danbury. And we'll get into this in segment two. Goes over a hill into Ridgebury, right. which is, uh, you know, a section of Ridgefield. And they had the famous Battle of Ridgefield, where, you know, a couple dozen people were killed. And then they went down, where else? But Route 7. And they marched back down to their, their ship in Campo Beach in Westport and took off and never came back. You ever think about if you told a 25-year-old kid that he's got to march from Danbury down to uh, you know, Long Island Sound? Well, they were 17, how, how much, 16, 15, 15. I know. 15, how so, much bitching and moaning you oh, hear? Forget it. Forget it. And don't you wish that you had a time machine? Wouldn't you love to go back to those days? Yeah. And just to, I mean, Until just you need a hot shower. It. Until you need a yeah. hot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, steak. Wow. So, uh, yeah, no, there's some great stories about Route 7. And I, I don't know about you guys, but back in the old days, I used to love driving Route 7. And when I say the old days, about 15 years ago, they widened it, right? So now it's two lanes in each direction when you leave Danbury and head down to Ridgefield. Before that, it was one road. And it was just a magical road. And we're going to talk about that in the second segment as okay. to why. Cool. We'll be back with some more shit you didn't know about the place you live with Mike Allen from the Ethan and Lou Morning Show on I-95. Hey, Mike. Mike. Hey, there we are. We're back. We're back. Good morning. Poke me there. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know. If I we kind of left off with the history of routes six and seven and some amazing facts about uh, the length of the two of them, where they go, and how the intersection of six and seven is kind of 
uh, ground zero, for lack of a better term, for the Native American tribes. And, and, and also for the development of the area. I mean, this is why George Washington said this is a strategic spot for the Continental Army to store its supplies there. That's why the mall wanted to locate there. That's why the, the fair was there, and everybody came, because you could get there. Six and seven, you know, are major, major transportation routes. But, you know, we've, we've so developed that area, right? And so one of my favorite drives is to actually go what I call the magic two miles, which is when you get on Super City, take exit three off I-84 and you right. head south on Route 7. And as soon as you go past the mall and get that out of your rearview mirror and you start driving down toward Ridgefield. And next time you do that, just ask you to take a little extra time, just kind of look carefully at what you're driving through. You're snaking through some pretty big hills in there. And in the old days, which is like 15 years ago, before they widened that road, it really was the road snaked in between these hills. And I grew up in Southern County, and I can tell you, when you were along the, the what they call the Gold Coast of Fairfield County, at sea level, and you would want to drive up to see the, the hills of Northwest Connecticut, this is where the hills hit you, was right south of Danbury Airport this Route 7 area. And people still to this day talk, you know, they sort of wax romantic about the past of, you know, when you drove up there, it was just majestic. It's unspoiled. It's beautiful. It's tough to look but, around now without being killed by another driver doing well, that, 90. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> and it really is beautiful. I worked at a spot up there just off the side of the road, and you have the train tracks on the one side, and then there's some plazas on the right-hand side. But if you do take a minute and look up, the hills all around you are beautiful. It, it is. And so what you've got there, and this is what I want to focus on here, is you've got the highest altitude points in Danbury, right? So... Uh, you've got the you know, Moses Mountain, Thomas Mountain, Spruce Mountain, and Pine Mountain in Ridgefield right nearby. And if you drive up, there's, you know, very creative roads, Pine Mountain Road, Spruce Mountain Road. <laughs> well, guess what? You know? <laughs> and you drive up those and turn around and drive back down. The views are stunning. And some forward-thinking people preserved a lot of this land. So there are, if you like to hike, there are hiking trails all over the place. Seriously. Right? Yeah, a huge, and I'm going to talk about this in just a second. The The important thing is, you know, we were talking about the Bernie of Danbury and the, you know, General Worcester charged out after the British went through Ridgebury and Ridgefield and down Route 7. He went right through that area, and it took him 150 years, but the state of Connecticut said, let's preserve the land where he marched over, and that's now called Worcester Mountain State Park. And nobody really goes to Worcester. I mean, it's not like Squans Pond State Park. It's yeah. not like a destination, but it's it's, it's hiking trails. How do you get to from, Worcester Mountain State Park? Well, we're going to talk about that. Oh, okay, in a second of course too. We are. So <laughs> there's, there's, there's whole story here. It's unbelievable when you start digging into this. So um, so they have Worcester Mountain State Park. It was it was actually dedicated back in 1920, uh, and it's uh, was the 23rd state park in Connecticut, which, you know, they've got 100 state parks in Connecticut, so it was one of the earliest ones, and it just sits there. It's 440 acres of just beautiful, pristine land. Charles Ives, who a lot of people have heard about because he was a famous American composer, he was born and bred in Danbury and, you know, grew up here, and he used to love to hike and camp in these same hills. And they built the Ives Trail, which connects Ridgefield, Danbury, Reading, and Bethel. That's a walk. It's an unbelievable walk. But one of the beauties is if you do it, you'll find the cabin that Charles Eyes used to hang out in. Come on. Is still there. That's cool. Yeah. So You're pissing off a lot of hikers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thing to themselves for now. Yeah. So now the other thing about Worcester Mountain, there's not a lot of things that make Worcester Mountain State Park stand out. But in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, when nobody had a job, they had this thing called the Civilian Conservation Corps. And this was uh, FDR had put together jobs for you know, people who had no, no jobs, generally men, on government-owned property with projects that had to be done. And there was something called the Dutch Elm Disease was going through pretty rampant in the 30s. So they brought a team up to Worcester Mountain State Park to weed out all the trees that had this so it wouldn't infect other trees. And they built a little encampment there. And that encampment is there to this day. So we're going we're, we're gonna to get back into that in just a second. But what I really wanted to get into was the fact that not only was Danbury have all this, you know, hiking trails up there, it's a beautiful area, but it was a vacation destination. So you go back in history, again, 1920s cars are just coming in, right? What was it like for somebody in Norwalk 
to have a vacation. They never had vacations in cars before, right? This is a brand new concept. So they're driving from, you know, sea level at Long Island Sound, come up to the north. A thing called Candlewood Lake had just been formed in the 1920s. So there was all sorts of hiking and camping and fishing and swimming and boating and things to do there. Uh, there was the Danbury Fair. The people used to come up to the traffic on the two-lane Route 7 mm-hmm. in those days was horrendous when really? the fair was in place. I mean, it was miles long, miles long. And it was it was horrible. There was no other way to get around. Oh, good thing we got rid of it. I don't want to yeah. derail you too much, but I know a little bit about... I, I did some research on the Merritt Parkway not all that long ago. Did they have a similar problem? The Parkway, they had to put out a law many years ago to tell people to stop hunting from the median. <laughs> because people would get out of their cars in the median and start shooting. I didn't did know you, that. Oh, no, okay. I did not know that. But that's like, I love that. I'm <laughs> making a note right here. This yeah. is great. Um, and, and so the other thing they had, and this is going to stretch some people's memories, but there was a, 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 a landmark, a famous landmark on Route 7 in Danbury called the Indian Trading Post. And anybody who remembers it definitely remembers it. There was a teepee outside. Yep. There was a fake uh, deer and, and, the, and the cabin there. And there were a bunch of little single-room cabins. And so I did the research and found out that in the 1920s, when these were, you know, these, these vacations were just starting, this was a destination spot for Lower County. They would come up to these cabins. The Indian Trading Post didn't exist. Uh, that the, the building that it was in was the restaurants for these cabins. And there's a lake out back called the Sugar Lake Hollow uh, Pond. You could, it's spring-fed. You could swim in there. They own the highest point in Danbury called Moses Mountain, which is right up there, right near Lake Wabika, which we'll talk about next week. But uh, you could hike up to Moses Mountain, get a beautiful view, swim in the lake, hang out, drive around Danbury, see the, see the sights. And that was the destination. In 1952, a husband-wife team came in, converted the restaurant to the Indian trading post that a lot of people saw. And Route 7 traffic came through there, and they did very, very well. Now, that, that used to be where the Danbury VFW building is, the, right? The Elks Lodge the is Elks there Lodge, now. Yes. The Elks Lodge is there now. Route 7 also killed that business because when they widened it, right. they were widening it right up to their front porch. They took their driveway and everything else, so they had to, they had to go away. All right, now here's – we're going to get into some fun names here in just a second. So you asked, how do you get into Worcester Mountain State Park? You have to go to the Worcester Mountain Gun Club. Okay, I know where that right is. Right across the street from the Elks Lodge, yeah. there's the Gun Club. That's where the facilities were for that Civilian Conservation Corps. Okay, remember I told you they came in and wiped out the, the Dutch elm disease and right. they built a little encampment and they left the facilities there. That's now the gun club. Where you drive into that yeah. gun club, that's where the Civilian Conservation Corps was based back in the 1930s. Right on 7 after the, <clears throat> after the mall, right? On yeah, the right? Yeah, yeah. When, yeah, exactly. Now, based at this gun club today is the Pacquioke Rod and Gun Club. It is the oldest trap shooting club in the United States. I've shot up there. It's cool, but you have to have a special invitation if you're not in the club. Well, it's you have to go yeah, as a guest yeah, you, or something. Yeah, but you can get a membership for 25 bucks for a year. Oh, okay. And get in there, but there's only one day a week that you can do it as a general public. Otherwise, you have to be in the club. Gotcha. The club started in 1899. Where it used to be based, where this trap shooting used to occur was by Danbury Hospital. There's some Makes woods sense. out there. You know, you know where you're you know, going <laughs> to shoot somebody by accident? That's right. You're right there, right there by the hospital. There's uh, Worcester Cemetery right next to yeah. the hospital. You've seen that? Well, there's Huge. some woods around that. Mm-hmm. And back in the day, it was called the Tamarack Woods. That's where they shot. And then they moved over to Danbury Airport. Back in, in the day, Danbury Airport was only one runway, and it was north-south. And by the way, coming in over those high peaks and landing you know, from Ridgefield at that airport, that's how you used to have to do it. They didn't have the east-west runway. And so at that section of Danbury Airport, there used to be a small golf course. And the Rod and Gun Club was there for about 20 years. And they would do, you know, their trap shooting there. Then they moved over to Worcester Mountain State Park. So they've been there continuously, you know, in existence. Now, here are some of the names of people that have come up to shoot at the gun club. Okay. Babe Ruth. Come on. Lou Gehrig. Bill Dickey. John Philip Sousa, the composer of yeah. Stars and Stripes Forever, my favorite, Annie Oakley. Come on. So Annie Oakley. Now, you know, you all hear about Annie Oakley. Yeah. Do the research on her. She's unbelievable. She was born in Ohio, dirt poor, dirt poor. 
by 15, she had outshot the best male sharpshooter in the country. And so all of a sudden, she, she is the first female superstar in the U.S. Annie Oakley is the first one who's like the first woman who's like out there. So, so all of these notables, they came up they to, came up to, to do tra- trap shooting. And they were doing it when it was over at Danbury Hospital in Tamarack Woods. This wow. is where they came over. And they would dress up in their Sunday best. I mean, these guys were wearing tuxedos almost. Oh, yeah. And then and Babe then the, Ruth would yeah. do his Sunday worst when the, when the shooting <laughs> yeah. you know, He was a hideous human being. <laughs> so, so Annie Oakley was with Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show, and she was adopted by Sitting Bull, who beat General Custer at the Battle of Bighorn. Uh-huh. And she, he called her Little Sure Shot. And that was Annie Oakley's nickname when she was in Danbury was Little Sure Shot. So anyway, so she she lived uh, into her sixties and then she she passed on. But she came to Danbury I think twice, as a matter of fact. But the Packy Oak Rod Club, Rod and Gun Club. I mean, you might say Packy Oak was that. That was the original American Indian name, and the first name of Danbury was the plantation of Packy Oak before it was Danbury. This so in the old, oldest maps, mm-hmm. it's plantation of patio. Mr. Allen, yeah, we, we gonna, do have we to, gonna have a test we have, on this we, later. We, 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 so, we do have to kind of wrap, start wrapping. La, last thing, okay. twenty five bucks a year. If you know anything about trap shooting, which I didn't, you stand sixteen yards away from the trap. You you you'll pull. Right. A little four and a quarter inch disc goes flying up at forty miles an hour, and you get for six bucks, you get twenty five shots. Good luck. Six, Look at that. Not, not a bad deal. I was shooting it with a shotgun. I had the wrong gun. I'm still <laughs> capping though out of the air. <laughs> Mike Allen, excellent job. We appreciate you, gentlemen. You. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Next week.